afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Hub Cures event uh, on a uh, rainy summer day. Um, welcome to uh, some of the uh, old timers who've been here many times, and, and welcome to any new people. Um, so uh, I think uh, you all know, but I will repeat that these Hub Cures events are leading up to our um, uh, annual MALSI Plus 2020 event on July 22nd. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers and posters. Uh, we got a whole bunch of poster applications um, and um, you know lots of networking time as well as uh, the Curious Reactor 101 matching program. Um, we now have a register for MALSI button uh, right up here to the right of the drop-down menus, uh, right next to the, if you have your photo uh, for, your, uh, for yourself. If you uh, click on it, um, uh, your email will be recorded and you will get an email following this event uh, with a registration link. So please do register for MALSI Plus, it's free. Thanks to our sponsors and thanks to the fact that it's online. It'll be online uh, for the last time, hopefully. Um, and we'll go back to having it at the Cambridge Marriott the following year. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, uh, introduce Karen Utkoff, uh, the moderator, uh, and uh, she will introduce the speakers for tonight. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to, to this panel. Tonight, we're going to be exploring uh, the, the, the uh, potential uh, roles of universities in, in uh, creating more resilience during crises like the pandemic. Uh, I'm privileged to have Kathy Claprich from Boston University uh, here on the panel, along with Peter Reinhardt from UMass Amherst, they will introduce themselves. I will just make a couple of observations and introduce myself. So I'm the Director of Venture Development at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences at UMass Amherst, and I'm also the Site Director for the University's uh, Innovation Core site. Uh, I think we've got a couple of fantastic institutions here this evening, one urban, one more rural. Uh, of course, uh, BU is a private, uh, institution, UMass Amherst is a public. They're both considered uh, doctoral universities with very high research uh, activity. So they are both powerhouses in their own right. And with that, I'd just like to uh, welcome uh, Kathy and Peter to the stage. Hi. Hi, Kathy. That works. Hi. Hi, fantastic. So I'd like to I'd like to start with each of you just introducing yourself uh, briefly to give people an appreciation for the background that you brought to this um, this effort. And Kathy, I'll ask you to go first. Sure. My name is Kathy Clefferich. I am professor and vice chair of biomedical engineering at Boston University. And sometime around April of last year, I also became the scientific director of the brand new uh, BU Clinical Testing Laboratory, which is a role um, I was asked to do um, as uh, that we really reflected what I was working on at BU at the time, which is um, I was the director or am still the director of the Precision Diagnostics Center, which is a center focused on largely on, on point of care diagnostics and distributed diagnostics for um, infectious disease and environmental monitoring type work. Uh, my personal work in my own laboratory is on point of care. Um, detection of infectious diseases. But of course, <laughs> if you can do one little small test and you, you can have a bunch of robots, you can do a lot of little small tests at once. So that's how I ended up um, working on the uh, clinical testing, building the clinical testing facility at BU. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, Peter, can you tell us about yourself? Sure, so uh, just by way of background, I've had a, a fairly mixed background. I started life in academia at Duke Medical Center, where I ran a research lab for many years. I then started a biotech company and 
uh, was in biotech for a number of years. Then a company was sold to Large Pharma who asked me to join them. And somehow I ended up in Large Pharma uh, working at first Wyeth and then at Pfizer for a number of years, uh, running everything from preclinical to phase two. Uh, then I started another biotech company in Cambridge, Proteostasis Therapeutics, that had an IPO about six years ago, which gave me an opportunity to step back on that after having developed two clinical programs and took on uh, the directorship of a new emerging institute at UMass Amherst that was poised to become a more translational institute for what had been a more basic science campus. And so uh, I, uh, it was a very broad institute, had everything from life sciences, biotech, engineering, uh, wearable devices, uh, public health, a software app. So uh, in a way it was very educational for me to sort of have broaden out a little bit, but always with the idea of moving from a trans from a basic science foundation towards a more translational, outward-looking industry partnership type approach, and uh, had been working on the campus for about close to five years when the pandemic started, and all of a sudden um, we were in this beautiful 300,000 square foot building with millions of dollars worth of expensive new toys, and all of our faculty, students, and myself were sitting at home pretty much doing nothing. And so uh, pretty soon a number of us banded together. And, um, you know, at least Catherine can, or Kathy can say that she was tapped on the shoulder and asked to do this. Um, my uh, my uh, approach to this was slightly different and in a way more self-inflicted because I actually ended up writing a white paper to the chancellor saying, we have all of this equipment and space and people sitting at home and we've got this pandemic raging maybe we could be doing something about it. And of course, once he said what, I wrote this little plan for creating a new clear lab to do some clinical testing and at least uh, do something to keep the campus safe, amongst other things like making VTM and face shields and parts for ventilators, etc. But uh, it was a really uh, very powerful effort and uh, just the volunteerism on campus was amazing. But uh, kind of led to, like I said, my putting up the hand to say, why don't we start a clear lab? And, um, little realizing what I was letting myself in for, but I'm sure we'll be talking more about that as the night goes on. Yeah, that, that's, a great, that's a great pivot point. Let's talk about what it is that you actually did do. You know, what is the, for each campus, what did you create? You know, when did it open? Uh, you know, when did you get your CLIA uh, certification? Uh, what testing are you offering? I think you both developed your own testing. Uh, you know, who's being tested? Uh, the students, faculty, people from the community. You know, so give us a rough idea of the numbers and, and the capacity of each laboratory, please. Peter, you might as well continue on and then turn it over to Kathy. Okay, well, let me start. So we started with, with zero. We had no lab, no space, no equipment, uh, no test. Uh, in a way, it was kind of foolhardy to even propose this, but um, I wrote the white paper. I got a phone call from our chancellor sometime in, in June, and he just called me up at home and said, I just read the white paper, and I'd like you to make it happen. So move forward and execute. So from one day to the next, I was ordering equipment when none was to be had, ordering supplies when none were to be had, uh, working with faculty teams to build an assay. Uh, we didn't want to take any of the commercial assays. We were very worried about supply lines. We decided our differentiator was going to be, we were going to build an assay from the ground up with salt solutions as our input, no kits, nothing that could run out of a supply. And so we spent a month or so building an assay. In the end, built what is an exquisitely sensitive SARS-CoV-2 viral testing assay. In fact, we have to back off. Our sensitivity level is is at about 50 viral particles per mil, which is which is very very sensitive. But so we built a good assay. We then looked into the paperwork of how do you start a clear lab and realized that we were going to be writing for the next six weeks about 200 pieces of paper that you need just to put a submission for a clear lab in. Uh, so we spent a lot of time writing. Of course, we had to hire people, we had to order equipment, we had to renovate space. We built ourselves a Gantt chart that had about 75 colors all sitting on top of each other because everything had to be done at the same time to get your license. Um, 
uh, I could talk at length the, the huge number of activities that, in fact, it took a village to do this. In the end, we had well over 100, 150 volunteers helping us to do this. Um, but we did go from concept to having an approved clear lab with a state inspection and an assay inspection in about 95 days. So it was just 95 days that I would never want to go through again in my life for anything. But uh, it was very satisfying when I think it was sometime in early September, we got the inspection, we passed on first our first run through. And all of a sudden, all this hubbub of activity that was all theoretical, from one day to the next, flipped the switch. And all of a sudden, we were testing first hundreds of specimens a day, then a thousand specimens a day. And in very short order, we ramped up to about 6,000 tests a day. Uh, which for our campus is a it's a pretty large number of tests, and, and we can talk a lot more about the logistics of how do you get six thousand tests, and how do you manage to get them into your facility? You know, all of these logistical things that are trivial when you're talking about one or five or ten things become a very different order of magnitude problem when you're talking about six thousand things every day, day by day by day by day. Six thousand of these things are coming into the lab, so. Um, phenomenal experience. It was actually um, very rewarding, not just for me, but for everyone associated with the effort, because in a time when a lot of people were losing their jobs and facing incredible hardships, uh, or sitting at home with very little else to do, we had the exact opposite problem. We were, we were drinking from a fire hose every single day. But in a way, it actually maintained us and gave us energy as well. So hard as it was, it was a just a phenomenal experience. So Kathy, give us the the BU take on that. I'm guessing you had uh, volunteers and a, and a, a lot of moving parts too. So give us an appreciation for what you did. Yeah, so it was roughly about the same time period, but sort of shifted maybe a month earlier. Um, I always take notes on paper when I have meetings, and my first entry was at the end of the last the last week of April, and it was uh, you know saying a call from Bob Brown, the president of the university, basically saying you know can you do this? You g give me a white paper, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, in, in basically 48 to 72 hours. So uh, luckily on the BU campus, uh, we had a couple of things in place that allowed us to accelerate very quickly. The first thing was that at the medical school, um, they had, there had already been a lab called the CREM, the C-R-E-M lab. They do um, tissue engineering and um, stem cell work. They were all sitting at home and George Murphy, who runs that lab, basically did what Peter did and said, you know, we need to scale up for the hospital, for the community um, at Boston Medical Center. And they had all of their people come in and run chiogen extractions by hand and a laboratory developed PCR test by hand um, that they got EUA approved very quickly um, at the beginning of April. And so <clears throat> George was my first stop. And my second stop was uh, Nancy Miller, who was who runs the clinical testing lab over at uh, Boston Medical Center. And both of them said, 6,000 tests a day is crazy. <laughs> Um, we can't do it because they were doing everything by hand. Um, but here are the things you have to do. And uh, basically between talking to them and reading the white paper that came out from uh, Jennifer Doudna's lab at UC Berkeley, and I'm, I'm an alum of Berkeley, so I gave them a call as well. And I talked to a bunch of folks there, um, was able to say, okay, we can do this, but only if we have robotics. Um, and my, I work with very small microelectronics and robotics are very big <laughs> microelectronics with lots of moving parts. And luckily um, I have a colleague, Doug Densmore at BU, who I collaborate with on other things, who is um, an expert in programming and scheduling liquid handling robots specifically for systems and synthetic bio work. And so he was able to assess very quickly with a group of students and postdocs, this is what we need to buy and we can't do it 
unless we have this equipment. Um, and Doug and I presented that to Bob Brown and he came back and said, buy the robots. And we made that decision not one minute uh, too soon. Um, we bought eight liquid handling robots to do basically everything in the lab. We already had started to purchase the RT-PCR machines because we anticipated um, that the Precision Diagnostic Center would be somehow involved with COVID-19 testing. Um, and so we had started to build up that aspect, but we really just had an empty lab space, um, also in a, a new building. Uh, the robots showed up just before July 4th, the assay was being developed um, by my students in my laboratory. Uh, and then the protocols for the robots that we didn't have yet <laughs> were being developed by Doug's students in his laboratory. And those two things were, were married um, uh, around July 4th weekend. And we did validation and had our um, pre-EUA submitted uh, and ready to go for first clinical delivery of tests on July 27th. And since then, we've done 1.1 million tests. Um, but I mentioned we had two things in place that allowed us to accelerate. And the, the, the second thing we had in place was that we did have on the Charles River campus a CLIA license in place. Mm -hmm. There was one individual, um, Dr. Dean Tolan, who's been maintaining a CLIA lab um, very close to the space in which we now work, which now also houses his laboratory um, for since I think the early 90s. He's been the sole source of a clinical laboratory test for a specific genetic disease um, around the world. And so he's maintained that license to do a high complexity genetic test um, since that time and had really good relationships with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the inspectors there. So we were able to expand <laughs> Dean's lab and his license to include um, this much simpler, actually, laboratory developed test than the one he does, um, but do it many, many, many more times than, than he does. And without that in place, we wouldn't have been able to make it um, to our August 1st deadline for students coming back to campus. We tried very hard to come in on that loophole we have our medical, uh, our university health services building directly across the street from ours. And the inspectors or DPH told us, if you are in contiguous space, you could actually get the license to cover you. And we could not make it contiguous. There's one road between us. And yeah. And at Boston Medical it. Center, at Boston Medical Center, the CREM lab was contiguous just by chance yeah. with the clinical testing lab. So they were able to work on that CLIA license um, using that loophole. With us, luckily, Dr. Tolan's lab was small enough that we just took his lab and moved it into our lab, <laughs> reapplied for his CLIA license in a new location, which was great for him because he got a brand new lab. <laughs> and then the continuous space um, we built out to run our LDT. So, you know, and of course then, you know, getting CLIA uh, approval for the test required all the normal paperwork that you would have in the inspections, but we could wait for our, you know, quarterly inspection um, for CLIA in, in November instead of having to front load it all into um, July and August. Well, we must have been fully clear inspected almost at the same time because <laughs> in early November, we got our full CLIA license as well. So I have this vision of you bidding against each other for equipment and, and, and for time on the inspector's schedule. But let me pop up a level. You both mentioned campus leadership and, and, uh, and the decision. So Share with us a little bit about why it, why campus leadership felt it was a priority to establish this testing capacity on your campuses. Uh, you know, lots of campuses around the country have contracted things out, done things differently. What was the what was the um, what was the motivation here? Well, I. I Part of that, you know, week-long turnaround time on the white paper involved talking with people at the large diagnostics companies and at some smaller diagnostics laboratories to see if we could cobble together. It became very it became clear very quickly that 
the larger, the large conglomerates were not going to be able to give us the turnaround time we needed for surveillance testing. Back in April, surveillance testing was not accepted yet as um, as something that was uh, considered, you know, valuable and coverable by insurance. So the large companies were prioritizing people who were sick or people who were in, in, in nursing homes or other institutions and people who were not sick and young um, were not going to get prioritized in that system. And so turnaround time was not going to be 24 hours, which is what we needed to build the contact tracing and quarantine system that we wanted to. And I think that's true for most institutions that ended up either doing their own testing or using um, the Broad Institute's um, test just because the 24 hour turnaround time was required. And we weren't even able to cobble together um, a bunch of smaller laboratories that could do it for us with that kind of turnaround time uh, with any guarantee um, at all. And so it became clear that the cost per test and the turnaround time, in order to get them low enough, we had to do it in-house. In and then that included the cost of renovating the space, hiring the people and buying the equipment. Um, it, it still costs significantly less than um, outsourcing it. And at the time we just simply couldn't buy what we needed in terms of turnaround time. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, also if you think back to those days, it's not like even Broad was still just getting going. Nobody knew exactly what the capacity there was gonna be how much turnaround time resiliency they would have, exactly as you say, the testing lab, you know, the, the quests and, and lab cores of the world, their turnaround time at that time was seven to 10 days. You know, our contact tracers were saying, if we take seven days for our testing, we may as well close down the campus tomorrow. It just can't be done. So the combination of cost savings, we have a population of more than 45,000 on our campus. You multiply any number like 10 or $20 by 45,000 per week, you're talking about millions of dollars per week. And so the cost became a big uh, factor for us. The turnaround time became a big factor because if we wanted to preserve our campus from shutting down completely, we realized we needed to get to positives within 24 hours and less if we could. So not, not even discussed yet is all of the infrastructure that was put on place to allow us to do fast contact tracing and fast isolation. And we, on average, did it, you know, first contact was often four hours after the test results. So very, very fast. The last issue for us was uh, resilience. We were also worried that if the mass pike closes down, if there's a snowstorm in winter and we can't get three days worth of testing done, that could be another perfect storm where everyone's crammed together in small spaces because it's snowing. You can't get a test done because it's snowing and our, we would just spike to the point where we had done mathematical calculations to calculate at what point would the escalation of the spread of the virus be faster than we could keep up with it. And our only recourse was to shut the campus down completely. And that was the number we were continually fighting against. And it was also the main motivator for building our own testing. So, so now you all have, you know, built this really these extraordinary facilities. Hopefully COVID is, is receding into the past. Uh, it may not ever go away, but hopefully it's, it's not going to be a crisis for your camp, for the campuses or for the communities. But, but what, and, and I, so I want to make the turn and ask you to look forward. What do you see the role of the testing center, your testing centers being, uh, your testing laboratories being in the next semester? And then also going forward, what does, does this asset mean to your campuses? Well, so right now in uh, our plan, cur currently we, we haven't backed off on testing at all <laughs> for the, the summer. Um, and that, that decision was made because we have had um, almost everyone working from home who are not directly student facing. Um, and so last Monday, 50% of the folks came back to campus. And so we continue testing faculty and staff once a week, undergraduates of which there are very few on campus right now, twice a week. Um, and our, our concern is that in the fall, 
it, when August starts and we start bringing back um, people on campus, we have quite a large um, international contingent of students um, uh, at BU. It's 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 around 20 percent, 20 25 percent of the undergraduate population, and and you know higher overall. So. Our concern is that folks will be coming in with vaccines that are not necessarily the vaccines that are approved in the United States. And people will be coming from places where there may be variants that are different from those that are circulating in the United States right now. So we want to continue testing at the same rate. Um, certainly through September and into October, because we all know, we learned from last year that <laughs> Indigenous Peoples Day is a time when Everyone has happily gotten back to their college campuses and settled in and been tested, but then they all go and mix with the other college campuses or they go with their friends and they come back and a week later we had a spike in cases. So I, I think that the plan right now is to you know try to get through that first phase. Changes we put in place, um, we'll be putting in place over the summer will include, um, right now we're doing observed testing where folks um, observe sampling, where folks uh, sample their own um, nostrils with someone standing there in front of them. Um, for faculty and staff, it'll now be unobserved testing. They'll pick up a test kit and then get a new one when they drop off the old one. And so that'll allow us to shut down some of the infrastructure on campus that we put in place um, for people coming in and getting swabbed. Um, and But for undergraduates, I guess we don't trust them yet. <laughs> so we're still gonna watch them um, for, for a while. But um, you know, I anticipate we'll probably be have some level of testing through December, um, you know, through through the close of the semester. That may be that may go down to very low levels if there isn't a surge um, in cases in the fall. Um, but then after that, we will have this facility and this equipment. And um, I imagine, you know, right now we're, we're having discussions about what's going to happen next to that equipment. Um, it's really in the planning phases. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that there is always has been an interest on the BU campus at building a large scale robotics facility for systems and synthetic biology work. And those folks um, are co-located in the building where that laboratory is. And so I some of it, because it's quite large, will likely become part of that core facility. Uh, but as we learned <laughs> and Peter learned, having a CLIA license is is huge and, and being able to do laboratory develop tests under CLIA and the ability to um, have a space where we can run other um, FDA approved tests is incredibly valuable for not only for us, but for the community. And so I imagine some of the space will remain um, a clinical testing facility that will be used either, you know, in conjunction with research projects or, um, you know, as a, as a um, resource for surge capacity should it be needed um, later either at the university or or just in the community yeah yeah so our our view is not that dissimilar we we are optimists in general i think so we expect that the frequency and number of viral tests is going to decrease dramatically uh, of course that will be counteracted by the fact that the population density is going to also go up dramatically so when you actually do the numbers, it'll be uh, still a significant number of tests. We're thinking somewhere in the 15,000 tests a week, which is a lot less tests than we have been doing. But still, that's quite a few tests, 15,000 a week. Um, and that'll just be for the non-vaccinated population. We're actually going to hopefully use the viral testing also to be a little bit of a carrot to induce students to become vaccinated. Uh, we've also backfilled behind the viral testing. We've got uh, three other tests that are ready to go that we are just about to get uh, uh, EUA certification for. The second test is an antibody assay that allows us to determine who is actually making antibodies. We think particularly, as you say, students coming internationally, we don't know anything about the type of vaccine that they've received. Even though they may come in with a vaccination card, we'd like to actually test that with an antibody assay. We have a dried blood spot assay up and running that we just need to collect three drops of blood. We can tell people whether or not they're making antibodies. We have a second flavor of an antibody test that actually tests the, asks the next question, which is you might be making antibodies, 
but can those antibodies actually kill the virus? It's called a neutralizing antibody assay. It's significantly more sophisticated and involved than an ELISA-based antibody assay, but we have that test ready to go. And we've got some very interesting data already from those people that have um, received the J&J &J vaccine. Um, you may want to go back and get another vaccine if you can at all do it, because so far we're getting quite a few people that have had J&J &J that show no antibody no, no antibody titer in their blood at all. So just FYI, it's not scientific yet. We don't have the statistics and it's not a scientific conclusion. It's just the first blush data response from that assay. Um, the other thing we're also doing is setting up a clear base sequencing facility that will allow us to very quickly isotype the viral subtype in uh, that for any of the positives that we do pull up. You know, we, like everyone else, are watching the Delta variant very closely. And, it, you, know, uh, uh, you know, it was the UK variant that killed off all the variants before it. And UK variant went up and all of the other variants went down because the UK just outcompeted them. And now we're seeing UK turning over and going back down. And what's coming up is Delta. And so if you have a reservoir of unvaccinated people in our population, and by that I don't just mean the campus, but I mean the community. Western Massachusetts. Um, it just seems almost a foregone conclusion that we're headed for another spike if we can't get ahead of Delta by increasing the vaccination percentage. And I would argue we need to be up around 85, 95% to ward off another spike of COVID-19 positivity in the fall. And this one will be highly transmittable. You know, if you're in a small environment like a dorm or a, or a house, and one of you is positive, you can just about bet that the rest of the house will end up positive, given how effective this Delta variant moves from person to person. So those are the four types of things that we're setting ourselves up for, the viral testing, two types of antibody testing, the variant determination. And beyond that, we have longer term plans, but so much of this is gonna be tied up around what I now call COVID-19 fatigue where everyone is so ready to think of COVID-19 in the rear view mirror. Don't think about it again. Don't think back to the horrible days. And I have a concern that that will preclude a thoughtful discussion on how these multiple clear approved labs that now form a resilient network across the state and in parts even across the US if you allow all of that to flush away because the pandemic disappears, I think we'll have done our public health in the States a huge disservice. And I am now trying to explore models of how could you keep low level activity that allows the lights to stay on in all of these clear approved labs that have been started up to give you a much faster ramp up resiliency should something else pop up in the next three, five, seven years. And if you allow all of this to go away, I'm afraid we're gonna be repeating all of these hard learnings that Kathy and I will not be putting up. At least I won't be putting my hand up next time. And it'll be somebody else that may have to do all of these learnings again, pretty much from scratch to build up this, this capacity a second time. So that is a great, that is a great place to, to first of all, stop and ask, uh, everyone to submit questions uh, through the through the Q and A function, uh, and I don't see any right now. That may be my uh, my uh, poor use of the platform, but in any case, uh, I encourage you to do that. And in the meantime, I will ask. Um, we've got about ten minutes left, so I'll just ask both of you to to really, uh, you know. And Kathy, please go first. Peter, I think makes a really compelling point. Now, as somebody who's old enough to remember polio vaguely, AIDS definitely, um, you know, I, I don't have the luxury of saying, oh, things just go away. Uh, maybe polio sort of, but, but uh, you know, but AIDS not. Uh, what, what does the fact that you were able to build this capacity, that you've established it, uh, what do you think it means in terms of your campus's resiliency and for the next public health care, public health crisis, but also pop up to 
Massachusetts and nationally and, and extrapolate to other universities and to the capabilities that have really been built uh, certainly across the state. And, and, and then we'll ask Peter to have his say on that too. So my dog just put her face in the picture. So according to Peter, that makes it this a very interesting podcast. <laughs> the popularity is just increased fourfold. <laughs> so, um, you know, I I I, I think that um, you know for for us it would be like what, exactly what Peter said. I mean, for us to 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 wrap this all up and you know put it in the closet is you know, or even sell the machines. I mean, that, that would be an insanity at this point. Um, you know, there has to be, you know, some low level. I, I hope that, that, that the state and the, the, the federal government, I mean, one of the things I, I said a lot of times to journalists when I was being interviewed at the beginning of all of this was, you know, the federal government is not coming to help us. <laughs> and, we are all the federal government now. And that was really a lesson that I learned early. I kept saying, you know, I, I because of my work in, in infectious disease diagnostics and because of a center, you know, my center and, and, and interfacing with NIH, I was on the inside of a lot of phone calls at the very beginning uh, at the NIH about building capacity. Um, across the country and they were really focused on new technologies and uh, <clears throat> you know getting point of care tests up and running and it became very very clear very very quickly that we weren't going to get that fast enough um, for certainly for opening universities and institutions in September but um, you know definitely not you know probably by the end of the pandemic I mean now even you know I was able to buy my Binax now test in CVS last week, um, which I just bought because I could, but not because I needed it. You know, the time it has passed. And I, I feel like focusing on this part of infrastructure, um, you know, at the state level, certainly, and certainly in a state where we really care about, you know, we export healthcare, we export doctors, we export biotechnology um, that, you know, for us not to have have this, um, you know, set, set up ready to go, um, you know, in the background at all these different universities across the state and and even the region. I mean, it could be you know a regional hub for this kind of scale up and testing. Um, a lot of people talking about screening and and maybe 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 low level screening is something that Peter can talk about. Yeah, I I completely agree with what you say and. Um, now, one of the things I didn't mention is that we did a lot of community testing at our site. You know, we're not in Boston. We're, we don't have t 10 other testing bureaus within driving distance. So we were kind of it. And it also all of a sudden put the university into a different light because there are no other organizations that have the combination of space, technical know-how, the diverse skills needed from robotics to assay building to clinical testing. You need to be able to draw on lots of different areas of expertise. I mentioned it took a village to start this. Who else in a, in a region has a village of expertise together with the financial and space wherewithal to stand up a lab like this? So uh, I, it sort of emphasized to me uh, a new way of looking at campuses as these, these areas of expertise and resources that can pivot quickly and put something brand new together. Certainly I had, you know, I'd been in a clear lab and never really understood what it took to stand one up. And yet in 90 days, we, we stood up a lab like that. Uh, it, it, it means there is a role for campuses beyond being research sites or research centers and training institutes for our next generation of students and workforce. That, that, that infrastructure has a role to play. And exactly as you say, I think a combination of state and federal resources should have an interest in maintaining this capacity that very significantly adds to the resilience of the state overall. There is no way that DPH in its you know, two or three sites that it has offices could have mounted a screening effort. You know, I just did the quick calculation earlier today 
The six campuses, I just looked at quickly, BU, Northeastern, Tufts, Harvard, MIT, and UMass. Between the six of us, we stood up 5 million tests, 5 million COVID tests done over the last nine months or so. I just don't see that DPH on its own or any amount of private labs on their own could have done anything like that, particularly with 95 plus percent of all of those 5 million tests done within 24 hours. Yeah, because it's, just, it, it, yeah, and it's not, it's not economically feasible for them to do that, right? Because they're, you know, the cycle time of, of, of a pandemic, I mean, thank God we're, we know it's the next one's going to be shorter than this one because we can make vaccines faster than we could ever make them before. But to stand up, you know, to stand up a 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 test a day facility that you know you're only going to run for, you know, 12 to 18 months, it, it, it's not you know, it's not it's not a good business decision for for a big uh, for a big company to make, but for a public private partnership, it might be. And it's not at odds with our education mission. I mean, the people that are that worked on these labs and worked in these labs um, at BU, we did hire non students professionals to run them, but they were all um, you know young people. A lot of them just out of college, people who had laboratory degrees or you know wet lab experience, um, and it was you know and students did interface with the facilities in a number of different ways. Um, you know, and really learn, we, you know, it's providing data for us um, that we wouldn't otherwise have, um, you know, about the disease and it's and how it spreads and how, you know, we're going to think about a pandemic the next time around. I mean, it's, 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 you know, the research side is very, very clear how to use that data. And, and, and it may not be as clear or as top of mind, you know, to a large company um to to use that data in that way yeah yeah and i'd say you know the point you made about training students um the other thing we found i mentioned we had hundreds of volunteers and that stayed true even once the clear lab was up and running and even though you know you needed to have appropriately trained with a track record of human specimen testing in the actual lab you know a lot of the accessioning and quality control and robotic maintenance and it was all done by volunteers and they loved working in a clinical lab a because they wanted to make a difference in the pandemic but b as many of them were truly interested and i had a number of students come up to me afterwards and say i've actually changed my degree because of this experience i i want to do this you know for, as my career and so i can imagine that one of the other uses of these clear labs going forward beyond the public health and resiliency function for the state is a training function to actually really train up a, a new generation of young young uh, scientists or young lab, lab staff that really want to make a difference that that need six months in a clear lab to be able to get a job at any hospital or medical school so so i think it's wonderful to end on the points about resiliency for uh public health and the resiliency for students and the impact you're, you've had on, uh, not just on the pandemic, but on uh, people's future uh, careers and um, uh, trajectories. I know it's um, time for Priya to, to come on and wrap things up. I just wanna wrap up this portion by saying thank you to both of you and your incredible teams that have done this and really provided the, the resiliency for both of your campus campuses and with the other universities involved in Massachusetts, I think looking back, I'm gonna predict that this will be a model for how state you know, university networks can respond. So we're very grateful for, it to, for you and to you. Great to have been here. And I'm glad you mentioned the fact that it's the team that did the work. It's not an individual job. It, it took a hundred of us to do what we did. Yeah, at least, <laughs> at least a hundred. <laughs> Thank and you. Well, we're, 
we're going to get off stage, Priya, before you get out the hook. Okay, <laughs> so no, no, no problem at all. Um, but I couldn't have said it any better, Karen. You know, thank you so much, uh, Kathy, Peter, and Karen. This was a really fascinating conversation. Um, I mean, I enjoyed it. I'm sure the rest of our audience did as well. We got great insights into the tremendous work that you both spearheaded. Of course, it was a team effort, but your leadership is what kind of helped this uh, come to fruition. Uh, during, and uh, basically all your campuses, right, have benefited significantly uh, during this unforeseen pandemic. Uh, so very incredible work and thank you again for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, so uh, now I can let you all go. <laughs> but uh, a few other reminders for everyone else. Uh, the final July 13th Hubcure series uh, will be featuring Todd uh, Golub, uh, the director of the Broad Institute. Uh, so uh, Dale Van uh, DeMarc will be moderating. Please do not forget to join us for that one. Um, also join us at uh, Malzi on July 22nd. It's going to be a great event. Uh, there's an amazing keynote speaker, fascinating panels, uh, and a poster session which will showcase the amazing talent we have across the Commonwealth. So with that, I will let everyone go. Let's head back to the floor enjoy some more networking and stick around to meet uh, Peter, Kathy and the rest of our attendees and have a great time. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>